This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is February 26, 2021, and I'm producer Pat. We have a couple of interesting segments for you today. Christina and I had a chat with Dr. Stuart Robbins about the naming of astronomical objects, and Adam does a deep dive into anti-Asian hate crime statistics. Before that, though, I wanted to talk about something I recently learned. I've been driving a long time, and things have changed, at least here in Ontario. Graduated licensing is an example. When I started driving shortly after my 16th birthday, I had to take a written test. Once you pass this, you got a learner's permit, but everyone called it a 365, and that's because it was valid for up to a year. My recollection is the only requirement is that I had to have a licensed driver in the car with me. There was also no minimum wait time to take the road test, so I had my full license within six months of turning 16. Now we have graduated licensing. So you still take a written test and get your G1. Now you need to have a fully licensed driver with you who has at least four years of experience. There are rules about both your blood alcohol levels. Yours needs to be zero. The licensed driver's has to be under the legal limit, which here is 0.05. You can't drive on highways, what we call 400 series highways, or at night. And then you usually have to wait 12 months to move on to get your G2. This requires a road test, and if you pass again, you have to have a blood alcohol level of zero, and there are some restrictions on how many passengers you can have depending on your age. Then another 12 months later, you can take another road test to get your G license. So graduated licensing is much more strict, and I actually had to go through this when I got my motorcycle license. Anyways, I digress. When I took driver's ed, there was a mantra that probably many checkers over a certain age are familiar with, and that was hands at 10 and 2. This is referring to where you grip the steering wheel as envisioned on a clock. According to a popular mechanics article, this remains a common belief among many people. I too believed it until just recently when I saw a Today I Learned post on Reddit about it. I asked a few people who were in my age group, and they were also surprised. Because it turns out, 10 and 2 made sense when we learned to drive, but it hasn't been the right way to hold the steering wheel since the 90s because, well, airbags. Particularly the incorporation of airbag modules into the steering column, which are designed to protect your head and chest. AAA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and just about every other source I looked at say that you should grip the wheel at 9 and 3 o'clock, and some even go further suggesting 8 and 4 to avoid the airbag mechanism as much as possible. There isn't a lot of formal research on those two hand positions, but what has been published suggests that 8 and 4 might lessen your control of the car. The American Driver and Traffic Safety Education Association basically say that the higher up on the wheel your hands are, the more likely they are to be directly over the airbag cover when it opens. That is when nitrogen gas inflates the bag at 150 to 250 miles per hour, roughly 250 to 400 kilometers per hour. The National Highway Traffic Administration reports injuries from improper placement of hands when an airbag deploys, including serious cuts, bruises, broken bones, amputations, and some even more traumatic hand injuries that can be life-threatening. AAA also says that the bags can slam your hands directly into your own face, causing broken noses and concussions. Dallas Police Sergeant Paul Hinton teaches law enforcement officers how to drive safely in emergencies. He says nine and three is the right answer. So yep, it would seem I need to update my way of driving. One other thing, the hand over hand method of steering like a ship's captain, I learned is also out. Instead, you're supposed to do something called the push pull. That is push up with one hand and pull down with the other without crossing over. State Farm's guidelines for beginning drivers says, quote, hand over hand maneuvers during turning should be avoided to prevent arms from being in front of a deploying airbag in the event of a crash. Serious injuries may result during such an occurrence. So there you have it. I've been driving wrong for decades. Not only that, but the way I've been driving is dangerous. If you two learned that 10 and 2 was the way to grip the steering wheel, or that hand over hand turning was correct, and like me, had no idea that things had changed, hopefully this short segment helps. And with that, I'll throw it to Adam and our chat with Dr. Stuart Robbins. I hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy, and we will talk to you soon. What's up, cuboids? There's been a lot of news recently about hate crimes against Asian people in the U.S. These are, of course, troubling, and such acts should be condemned and resisted as much as possible. With certain shocking statements about these statistics claiming rises in hate crimes against Asians by 1900%, I thought it was worth looking into the data. Now, before I get into the weeds, I want to make my position here clear. 
Hate crimes of all kinds, including those against Chinese or other Asian people, are terrible. Reducing these and other crimes is very important. I believe the best way to reduce certain types of crime is through evidence-based approaches, which are only possible when accurate data is used to give an accurate picture of the current situation and trends. This isn't about ignoring certain problems, but rather determining what does and doesn't work based on policies and how they impact certain types of crime. So if you can see if crime's going up or crime's going down, you can say what we're doing is or isn't working. As such, I think it's important to question and look into crime statistics or claims about crimes when they might be incorrect and misleading. So some background on this. The story behind this increase in hate crimes is that some Americans are discriminating against Chinese people and other Asians because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The virus originated in China, and while it's of course absurd to blame any Chinese person for this, let alone a person who's living on the other side of the planet from where the outbreak began, um, some people seem to be using this as an excuse for discrimination. More specifically, many people are claiming that such acts were incited by the words of former U.S. President Donald Trump, who referred to COVID-19 as the China virus, the Chinese virus, and even Kung flu. I don't think I need to reiterate my distaste for the former president of the United States. Such terms are inaccurate and idiotic. As for being able to directly tie those comments to any particular hate crime, that kind of association is very difficult to prove conclusively. So there is a plausible mechanism for how these comments could have led to discrimination, but that isn't necessarily proving that there's a connection. So that won't be the focus on my segment. It's possible that that is linked, but uh, it would be a whole other thing to try to prove that. Now, ignoring the specific statistics for a moment, there seems to be no question that some hate crimes against Asian people were committed as a result of discriminatory attitudes brought on by the pandemic. As long as there are some cases where it is shown that this was the cause, such as when it is outright mentioned by the perpetrator of the crime, then it seems likely that there is an increase in hate crimes that may occur. So we have some cases that can be attributed to this, unless there happened to be a reduction in hate crimes against Asians for another reason. The assumption is they should be going up a bit, at least. Now, part of the difficulty is the trouble in getting actual hate crime statistics for 2020. The FBI collects very thorough hate crime statistics. In 2019, they collected data from 15,588 law enforcement agencies, tracking thousands of incidents. The 2019 numbers were released in November 2020, meaning we shouldn't expect to see the 2020 numbers until the fall. Maybe they'll make it a priority and we'll see them a bit earlier, but we still have some time to wait. What hate crimes against Asians may have looked like in 2020, according to these statistics, remains to be seen, but that data will likely give us a decent picture of what's going on. Of course, there will always be some things which bias statistics, such as how individual law enforcement agencies prioritize or document certain crimes, or even how victims report those crimes based on what's going on. So, 1900%. What's that number about? Now, that particular number comes from the NYPD, the New York Police Department. Their numbers compared hate crimes motivated by anti-Asian sentiments from all of 2019 to only the first half of 2020. And their numbers do show an increase of 1900%. Wow. So that might sound like a round number, 1900. It is a multiple of 100%. Another way of looking at this number is that it's a 20 times increase. 1900% plus 100% divided by 100% gives 20. So what are the numbers? Well, there was one hate crime motivated by anti-Asian sentiments recorded by the NYPD for 2019. In the first half of 2020, there were 20. So this is quite a jump, of course. 20 times more, the math is really simple. It looks like there's something going on here, but it's worth noting that there are small numbers being used every year and they vary quite a bit year by year. For example, let's look at some other years with anti-Asian hate crime. In 2017, there were six. In 2018, there were five. And then in 2019, like I said, there was one. So let's look at it another way. From 2017 to 2019, anti-Asian hate crimes went down by 83%, six to one. From 2018 to 2019, they went down 80%. From 5 to 1. I don't imagine there were many articles by the mainstream media celebrating the near eradication of anti-Asian hate crime in 2019. That'd be silly. The data also shows hate crimes motivated by anti-black and anti-Jewish sentiments. Both of these were far lower in 2020. Keeping in mind, of course, that this was a year-to-date number for only half the year. Anti-black motivated hate crimes went from 36 in 2019 to 18 in 2020. So a 50% reduction, with it only covering half the year. This basically means no change. Anti-Jewish hate crime 
had 242 cases in 2019 and 60 in 2020, so an almost 75% reduction. Even accounting for the fraction of a year being tracked, this is still a significant reduction. But the numbers aren't that big, and there are year-to-year fluctuations around those ranges anyway, so it doesn't really tell us much. We also need to consider the population demographics of New York City. The city is 24.3% Black or African American, 13.9% Asian. That there are slightly more anti-Asian hate crimes in 2020 than anti-Black hate crime is surprising given that there are so many less Asian people in the city. That said, in other years, there were almost five times more anti-Black crime. So if we look at 2017 and 2018, there were almost four times more anti-Black crime for the years 2017 and 2018, and 36 times more anti-Black crime in not 2019. That's because that's sort of an outlier with only one anti-Asian motivated hate crime in 2019. So yes, by these numbers, Asians are being disproportionately affected by hate crime in 2020. But this is after being disproportionately less affected in the previous year. By contrast, 13% of the population of New York City is Jewish, which is comparable to the percentage of Asians and quite a bit lower than the percentage of Black or African Americans. There are significantly more anti-Jewish hate crimes recorded every year compared to anti-Black. Four and a half times more in 2017, four times more in 2018, 6.7 times more in 2019. So does this mean anti-Semitism is a bigger problem than racism in New York City? I wouldn't make such a determination based on these numbers alone. There could be a lot of factors that are affecting it. There's also more anti-Jewish hate crime, 60 cases, in the first half of 2020 than anti-Asian hate crime, 20 cases. Now that's a three times increased, but they're similar sized populations. So what am I saying here? 20 for half of 2020 is a lot. A likely explanation for this increase is that there is more anti-Asian hate crime as a result of pandemic-related prejudice. It could be an outlier for many reasons. The 1900% number being thrown around is a deceptive statistic, but if you compare that same 20 cases to 2017 or 2018, this gives us a three to four times increase. So this is still big. It's not quite 20 times. There's still quite an increase going on if you use those metrics. Now, there are other numbers cited in other articles. A common source is the Stop AAPI Hate Database. So this is a new group which began tracking anti-Asian hate crime at the start of the pandemic. They frequently cite the number 1,843 cases of anti-Asian discrimination as of May 2020. But these are self-reported cases made through the website. We don't have a baseline for other years, and even if we did, the popularity of the site would drastically affect these numbers. So this is a case where something like the FBI hate crime statistics, which we don't have yet, would be more valuable than something like self-reported website. These same numbers were included in a United Nations report. So many news sources will talk about 1,800 racist incidents and attribute that to the UN, but ultimately it comes from the same place, comes from the same source. Another consideration in some cases is the general increase in violent crimes in many American cities in 2020. This likely would not impact the NYPD or AAPI hate uh, website numbers since the increases in violent crimes in the U.S. were later in the year after the start of the Black Lives Matter protests throughout many major cities in the U.S. Also, the factor there wasn't 20, wasn't 20 times. Uh, we're talking about percentage increases here. When all of the 2020 numbers are considered, we may find an increase in violent crimes against Asians in the United States, but this needs to be compared to the relative rates of violent crimes in specific cities and the country as a whole. So let's also not forget that the pandemic itself has just skewed a ton of statistics with people staying in more, driving less, uh, being exposed to different risk factors, different amounts due to drastically different habits and other factors. So 2020, any any when you measure it, uh, it is vastly different, uh, be it box office numbers, crimes, and even uh, hate crime statistics. Now, as I was recording this segment, some numbers came in from uh, hate crimes in Vancouver that I I just had to add in. um, And I think that's worth repeating and highlighting here. Now, those numbers suggest an increase in anti-Asian hate crimes by a whopping 717%. Again, that's that's like a huge number. It's not 1900%, but it's big. There were 12 reports in 2019 and 98 in 2020. So quite an increase. And the number 12 is, is small, and I don't know how much that varies, but it still seems to be quite an increase. So there, we're not dealing with large numbers here, but there's. it seems clear that 2020 is an outlier uh, when we're looking at this. And I, I think we will see numbers like that when all the numbers are in. Is there an increase in anti-Asian hate crime in the U.S. since the start of the pandemic? Probably, almost certainly. By how much? Well, that's almost impossible to tell today. But we may have a better idea in the fall when the FBI releases some of those numbers. 
What the absolute risk level is, as opposed to the change in relative risk, isn't terribly clear. But that kind of number is important to consider here. Look at that. Look at the total number of cases, not just a percentage change when we're dealing with small numbers. The 1,900% rise in hate crimes, while technically accurate for New York City between 2019 and 2020, is only true because 2020 was itself a very low outlier and cannot be used to infer such a massive increase in anti-Asian hate crime throughout the entire country of the United States. Regardless of what the specific numbers are, hate crimes of all types are a problem worth addressing. Holding discriminatory views against Chinese and other Asian people because of the pandemic is absurd and ignorant for anyone to hold, and this is especially bad for the former president of the United States who really should know better. Peace out, cuboids. So, Stuart, after you heard Christina's recent segment on baby names, you suggested that an interesting topic for the show might be planetary nomenclature, which I started to look up a little bit, and then I thought eh, it'd be just way easier to have you come on and talk about it. <laughs> so, Stuart, how do things in space get named? Yeah, the fascinating topic of planetary nomenclature. Uh, mm. So, the way things get named is that when two planetary bodies love each other very, very much, or oh. they have a fling behind the high school bleachers, <laughs> uh, you get a baby thing that has to be named. And unlike Iceland, we have a whole different set of rules. <laughs> so, uh, the only officially recognized body by astronomers that can name things is the International Astronomical Union, uh, which was created nearly a century ago to try to standardize this process uh, in order to ease communication. So that means, for example, if I refer to uh, Copernicus Crater, then American astronomers wouldn't think I mean one thing and German astronomers think I mean another thing and Chinese astronomers a completely different thing. They all know that there is one Copernicus crater. It is a prominent 85 kilometer crater in the middle smack dab of the moon. So, well, not in the middle of the moon, in the middle of the near side of the moon ish. I think when I started to look into the Stuart, like actually there were things on the moon, which was the one thing that, that people were looking at. I could see fairly clearly at the time had several different names. So there'd be craters with like four different names or three different names. Yeah, it's like navigation. So if I am driving somewhere that I don't know where I am and my iPhone says exit onto St. James Street, but the street sign says that this is 58th Street. And then another sign says that this is a park, you know, Roosevelt Parkway or whatever. It's like, all of these things, do they mean the same thing or are they different mm -hmm. things? And right. that's why we need to have a standardized nomenclature is to, again, facilitate uh, easy communications that you don't have several things with completely – well, you don't have the same thing with several different names or several different things with the same name. So there is pretty right. much just one Copernicus crater in the solar system. There is not a Copernicus crater on the moon and Mercury and Ganymede or, or a bunch of other places. It's just one. That's kind of why we have nomenclature. Another reason, at least uh, that there, that it's handled by the International Astronomical Union as opposed to the American Astronomical Union is so that we have equal representation. Uh, so that means, for example, that we don't have everything named just for white males who come from Canada, but that we equally represent gender and nationality and skin color and all these other you know things that need to be equally recognized so uh that's why we sort of have this one naming body and it's a, a central thing that astronomers recognize and that's that's what's important because we're very self-centered and we're all that we care about uh so <laughs> This almost sounds like my IKEA segment. <laughs> <laughs> well, except we publish our stuff. <laughs> it's not a completely internal thing, but it is actually kind of, now that I think about it, it is kind of similar to IKEA, where the IAU, for short, uh, the International Astronomical Union, has different naming systems for different types of things. So just like IKEA, craters would have one set of rules for names on a certain body and mountains would have a different set of names and uh, a different set of rules 
And uh, yeah, so I guess it is kind of similar to your IKEA segment for those who remember that far back. And for those who can't, uh, hey, there's a, a podcast called The Reality Check that you're listening to with a website, trcpodcast.com, that you can go to, search for IKEA, and find Christina's segment. That's a great website. Great website. So I've heard. Uh, so yeah, Pat, uh, as you said, there are lots of different names for different objects back in the day. Uh, and basically people have been naming things as long as they could really make them out. So after Galileo sort of refined the telescope for astronomy, uh, a lot of people in the 1600s were naming features on the moon. And we, we kind of adopted some of the most common ones that were named back in the 1600s uh, when we created the IAU and created the first lunar crater database back in uh, 1935 of this sort of standardized nomenclature. Uh, so what we've done is we've we've sort of gone beyond that a little bit. Uh, when the, the Soviets uh, first sent a space probe and imaged the lunar far side, uh, a lot of names, they got through the IAU uh, because they were the first to see these features. And so if you ever look at an atlas of the moon, a lot of stuff on the lunar near side, the big stuff is going to be named, um, well, Latin or Italian stuff like Mare Tranquillitatis or uh, Crisium or Oceanus Procolarum, that kind of stuff. Uh, but a lot of big prominent features on the lunar far side are going to be much more difficult to pronounce for Western audiences like uh, Tsiolkovsky or Fioktis. Tov, maybe. As I said, difficult to pronounce for Western audiences. I, I don't speak Russian. Uh, so apologies and, and, uh, to anyone Stuart, to be clear, when you say far side, you mean the dark side, correct? The dark side of the moon? No, and I, I hear the smile <laughs> in your voice right now. <laughs> I don't. And people can go to episode one of Exposing Pseudo-Astronomy in order <laughs> to find out about that. Another shameless plug. Yes, uh, that would be podcast.sjrdesign.net. Anyway, uh, moving forward, <laughs> as I said, the IAU has established all of these different rules for different bodies in the modern era. Uh, usually, the rules for names are based on the type of feature, as I said before. So a crater would be different than a mountain. Each of those would have different sets of rules. And the moon is sort of this hodgepodge simply because of history and we didn't want to completely wipe the slate clean and start over because then nobody would use it. Uh, you know, what, as I said, one of the whole points of nomenclature is to make it convenient. And if you've been calling something more tranquillitatis for 300 years, nobody's going to want to change that except maybe some pencil pushers, but you know, we got over on the pencil pushers. Uh, so if we go beyond Mercury, because now we get into, well, modern space age, we weren't able to name any features on planets other than the moon until we got to the modern space age. So the IAU was able to start to really create their set of rules once uh, we got to other bodies. So if we go to Mercury, things start to get interesting. Craters are named for artists, be them uh, painters or musicians or authors. Well, mountains are words for hot in different languages. Uh, valleys on Mercury are named for abandoned cities, towns, or settlements of antiquity. So you have these different kinds of names, and you'll notice that in none of those did I give a gender or did I give a culture, anything like that. And I will say that the IAU is is very careful, and they actually keep lists. You know, if this feature is named after a man, the next feature should be named after a woman. If this feature is named after an American city, then an American city should not the next feature be named. It should be named after an African city or something in China or Europe, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, they are very careful about that sort of equal representation because space belongs to everyone or to no one, depending on how you want to see it. So Venus is all about women because it's the only uh, planet in the solar system that is uh, named after a female deity. So uh, Venus, the Roman goddess of love. So different features are named uh, for different types of goddesses, uh, craters being the main exception to the goddess thing, uh, because they're named after women who haven't had an outstanding or fundamental contribution to their field of study if that crater is over 20 kilometers across. If the crater is under 20 kilometers across, uh, then we just give them common female first names, like Jane or um, Betty or, well, I guess that wouldn't be a common name anymore, but you get the idea. Is there a Christina? Is there one named Christina? 
I don't know. There aren't actually that many craters on Venus. Venus only has about 930 craters on it because it was completely resurfaced about 500 million years ago. But lines on Venus are named for goddesses of war. Mountains are named for miscellaneous goddesses. Plains are for mythological heroines. Undulating areas are for desert goddesses. And so on and so forth. The only exception really on Venus is uh, the tallest mountain. The tallest mountain on Venus is named after the famous physicist uh, James Clerk Maxwell. He's the only man on Venus and clearly overcompensating because he is the tallest feature on Venus. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, so <laughs> I, I'm not going to read through uh, the the entire page for other bodies in the solar system. Um, there will be a link up in the the show notes to the podcast. And, and where is that, Pat? TRCpodcast.com. Oh, I, that's a great website. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> uh, so. There will be a link up there that gives all of these lists uh, for different things. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, things do get interesting when you do start to run out of common stuff. And we're all human. And so uh, there are, is a sense of whimsy sometimes. And sometimes the mission team that studies the body or is the first mission team to really study the body in detail can get things through the system that the IAU might normally oppose. Uh, so, for example, on Titan, Titan is uh, the largest moon of Saturn. It has a thick atmosphere. It's really one of only three bodies in the solar system that has a, a reasonable atmosphere. Collis features on Saturn, so Col or Titan, uh, Collis being uh, small hills, they're named after characters from Middle Earth, from J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, mountains or Montes on Titan are named after mountain peaks in Middle Earth. So there is a Mount Doom on Titan. <laughs> Uh, there are the Misty Mounties on Titan and Mount Moria, among other things, on Titan. When we get out to Pluto, um, there there has been sometimes contention between mission teams and the International Astronomical Union. Uh, so on Pluto, we sort of tried to name things uh, a little bit differently. Uh, so there are, for example, famous ships of discovery, or famous space probes of discovery, sorry. So there's, for example, Pioneer. Uh, there's also Sputnik. And um, also some features are named after famous astronomers who have contributed significantly to the study of Pluto. So a few people on the New Horizons team, this is a, the New Horizons mission flew by Pluto in 2015. A few people on that team had as their graduate student advisor, uh, Jim Elliott, who had studied Pluto a lot and had recently died. And they were able to get one of the largest craters on Pluto named after him, for example. And so that's sort of how nomenclature works. Uh, it is a little bit of an arduous process, like any kind of bureaucratic process is these days. But I thought that it was kind of interesting and seeing that you were willing to go into the boring, boring, boring topic of nomenclature by talking about baby names. Uh, I thought that this might make an interesting TRC segment, as, as Darren sometimes does during his intro, emphasizing that TRC does cover some scientific curiosities. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. Oh, uh, Stuart, recently uh, the United States Space Force oh, announced that really? personnel will be referred to as really? guardians. <laughs> you want to go there? <laughs>